Welcome to the Eating Cast. I am Chris. And I'm Vincent. And today we're joined by Sabo Shen. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, Chris? What's up, Vincent? How are you? Hey, hey we're good, doing pretty good, good pretty good. Uh, for those who don't know Sabo, he is the CEO and co-founder of Vape Exhale, Hanu Labs, and Burner Labs. Am I, is that correct? Yep, you got it. Yep, you got there it. There you go. Awesome. Um, I know t- titles are always like kind of tricky, so I got to make sure that's right, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> titles titles are interesting. You know, I noticed uh, once I was able to put uh, those three letters of CEO behind my name, uh, more emails got opened. Um, conversations were just easier. I mean, it's funny. It's funny, you know, like how just three initials changes everything. But, you know, perception is a lot of reality. And I guess, uh, well, now that I have those three letters after my name, I'm not crying about it. Definitely. So, uh, Sabo, um, kind of give us like a rundown, like, you know, um, who, who you are, you know, um, what you're currently doing and kind of like where you're planning to go. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Sabo Shen. As I said, I'm the CEO and co-founder of three cannabis hardware companies, uh, Vape Exhale, Hanu Labs, and Burner Lab. Uh, each of those companies is targeted at a different type of consumer. So Vape Exhale is for the kind of like old school, hardcore cannabis connoisseur. Um, Hanu Labs is for you know your your newer soccer mom entry level cannabis user, and then Burner Lab is really designed to take both of the best features of both Hanu and Vape Exhale and put them into an affordable package, like um, you know devices that are thirty dollars and less, so that bud tenders who are typically the people that um, refer all the products to the new customers, not only could they refer them to these products, but they could also afford them too, which has been a big big gap in our industry where you know a lot of the bud Tenders are minimum wage workers that are recommending, you know, concentrates that are 50 to a hundred dollars a gram, but they can't afford it. So I always thought that was a big disconnect and we wanted to bridge the gap there. And as for myself, you know, outside of work, you know, I'm really focused on um, building up the Asian American community, um, really helping build bridges versus um, being divisive. And ultimately, you know, I have two daughters. So my most important job is being a father you know, really teaching them about what's going on in this world, not trying to hide things to them like the protests that are going on, but educating them so that when they're of age, you know, they could be great contributing members to society and to keep building, you know, a more inclusive society where um, we could be vulnerable with each other, where we could build. And it's not so much about, you know, what your title is or what your economic impact or value is to the country or to, to your society, but more how good of a person you are and how, how you make other people feel. Awesome. Awesome. So like, uh, can- kind of, or go ahead, Vince. No, I was going to say if cannabis hardware had, <laughs> was a car company stable, you figured it out. <laughs> Thank you. you, Thank the, you. The, the luxurious. And then you like give it to the affordable consumers. That's awesome. There you go. It's like your everyday, uh, econo car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly exactly we got our we got our tesla model 3 now that everyone hey, can afford Ooh. that's awesome that's awesome <clears throat> so like um say but kind of like uh with the whole cannabis industry kind of like booming now or like especially like in the more like uh public markets and the, like the public sectors and everything like that mm-hmm. and with like what you said like the um price discrepancies because i i know chicago we recently i believe this year um were able to now have vendors that legally sell to the consumers and like that discrepancy in like um like, well, like what you said earlier with like the price ranges and everything like that it's like really high and especially like over here in chicago we actually have a lot of taxes like i don't personally partake in like you know um usage of cannabis or anything like that but i've seen like um people taking uh photos of their receipts from these um tenders and it's like I think they bought like two, maybe like three eighths and it was like a hundred bucks or like, you know, something like that. And I'm like, that, to me, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, uh, taxes are really high out here in California too. I mean, they're north of 30%. So if you're spending a hundred dollars, you're going to pay like $33 in taxes, which obviously makes it very, very hard for people to afford it, especially if you're used to calling your buddy 
and he sells it for half the cost and doesn't charge you any tax, right? So yeah. there is kind of like this big divide between uh, the the regulated market and the private market. And, you know, that's the whole problem with having a lot of like government bureaucracy in there is that, you know, all these taxes, you know, they're, they're not going to the store owners. They're going to the bureaucrats that are, you know, wanting to have their hands in the cookie jar. And, you know, we are one of the most um, overly regulated industries and the compliance and everything that we have to jump through in order to put the product on the shelves is just, it's just so much where, you know, the vast majority of people in the cannabis industry, they're not making any money. And actually I'm very familiar with um, the Chicago landscape because you have two big companies, actually three big companies, Columbia Care, GTI, and Cresco, which are, which are huge, huge, um, uh, organizations. Uh, one of those three actually happens to be one of our investors. So yay, yay. Oh, nice. Let's cheer them on. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, like it, it's really shifted, you know, like um, uh, all those people that run those organizations, you know, they're, they're suit and tie folks, you know, like a lot of them do not use cannabis and they don't have the same relationship to the plant that I have. Um, where, you know, I basically, I mean, I don't drink, I don't use any other illicit drugs other than cannabis. And, you know, I started using cannabis very much as a medicine to help with sleep, to help with joint pain, um, to help with anxiety. So, you know, when I got into it, it was very much for those reasons. And the fact that I could feed my family off of it was just icing on the cake. And now that it's kind of turned into just like every other business, and it's no surprise to me. I came from the um, high tech industry, so um, I'm used to people saying, "Hey, I'm here to change the world," when they're really here to just increase the size of their bank account. So that's nothing new to me. Uh, but you know, when it came to the plant and um, the way, I mean, the reason why it's legal today, you know, it, it has nothing to do with the fact that the politicians just changed their minds. It has everything to do with the fact that most of these politicians and most of us at this point, we have at least one relative or one friend that we know that, you know, really had dramatic changes by getting off of um, anti-anxiety pills, SSRIs, um, anti-depression pills, you know, and switching to something a bit more natural and holistic and seeing the benefits of it and finally going, oh shit, you know, I have a loved one that really benefited from this. I can't just keep putting in policies that make it tough for people to have safe access to this medicine. And ultimately, you know, we're starting to see a shift where now where I'm from, you know, Oakland is about 20 minutes away. In Oakland, if you want to do other plant uh, medicines like ayahuasca, iboga, DMT, you could do all of those um, legally. And there's a place called The Haven where they have a full co cooperation from Oakland PD in order to have, uh, uh, they call them psychedelic psycho-assisted therapy sessions where you have licensed clinicians um, walk you through these, these, these uh, mystical journeys. And well, the great thing about this is the results coming out of these things are I mean, if you like to look at empirical data, which I do, I mean, the results are um, nothing short of amazing. I mean, if you look at any other form of healthcare, whether it's neurology, um, osteopaths, um, um, surgeons, uh, heart, you know, any of these other areas, like we've seen double digit increases since like the 50s and 60s on, on how well and how efficient the, the treatments are. But when it comes to mental health, you know, they were in the single digit success rates in the 50s, and they're still in the single digit success rates today, meaning, you know, less than one out of 10 of their patients actually has successful treatments with them. So with um, one single treatment of psilocybin or one single treatment of ayahuasca, they're seeing north of 85% success rates. So, you know, this is why as controversial as it is to talk about psychedelics, um, I'm a big proponent of it because if you just look at the numbers and the efficacy of it and you talk to the healthcare professionals that are utilizing these things, you quickly see that this is why. This is why a lot of people are jumping on it. This is why, you know, people like Michael Pollan have, have you know, done things like career suicide by writing books like How to Change Your Mind because he's seeing that these antidepressants, these antioxidants, giving kids Ritalin and Adderall, you're just making them chemically dependent on these things. You're not fixing them. And with these plant medicines, you're getting to the root problem, which is, you know, what happened to you when you were a child? What type of traumatic experiences did you not process? And what do you need to process so that you could be not just a better person for yourself, but be a better person to the entire world? Mm, I like that a lot. And I think there's a stigma too, where most people, I, I feel like maybe the older generation, maybe, 
but like when they hear people who use cannabis they still have that stereotype of they're like not that productive um yeah. and that they don't like like it's not helping at all like they they just want to get lost um what's the word uh escape from like you know reality just but i feel like the, what you're advocating like it definitely helped you with joint pain like you said and all other health aspects um did it help you with your mental health too Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like, I, I very much understand, like, people think, like, cannabis is something that, like, stoners or, like, lazy people use. But the fact of the matter is, you know, I work in, I worked in Silicon Valley, and I worked for five different companies that had successful exits, the smallest for 160 million and the largest for 3.4 billion. So as far as I was concerned, you know, I worked with five different teams of just A players. And I'll tell you this, North of 90% of them were all cannabis consumers, you know, from the entry level workers all the way up to the CEOs. And I really believe it's one of the best brain foods that you could give yourself. You know, the, the, your body has something called the endocannabinoid system, meaning that you produce your own endogenous, endogenous cannabinoids. So this is why when you, uh, uh, intake exogenous cannabinoids, it's a very familiar and relaxing feeling for people. And ultimately, yeah, you know, when I, it's just an education thing. And as we start seeing more and more people uh, become more and more vocal about their own use, you know, we'll start seeing that it's actually the top performers are utilizing this. And it's something that really stimulates and invigorates um, brain activity. Now, is it something that could be uh, abused? Of course, you know, I know tons of people that are wake and bake users that think that they're, they're like one of these productive um, cannabis users, and they're not. You know, they're able to keep their job and the fact that they keep their job makes them feel like they're a productive cannabis user. But, you know, th there's a big difference between um, utilizing cannabis as a way to serve you versus you serving cannabis. And that's one of the things that I like to de delineate as well is, you know, I'm a proponent of cannabis, but I'm a bigger proponent of proper conscious cannabis use, meaning that you should always be thinking about why you're utilizing cannabis. Is it because you want to relax? Hey, that's perfectly fine. Are you going to use it to get a bit creative and go to flow masters? That's perfectly fine. But if you're utilizing cannabis, like after work every day, cause you're just bored, then I would say, Hey, you know, you got to ask yourself, why are you bored all the time? And why are you utilizing cannabis? And ultimately, you know, that's a very tricky thing for people because, you know, the human mind likes to play a lot of mind tricks on yourself and, you know, justify reasons for what you're doing. And honestly, you're the only one that really knows the answer. So, um, if you're lying to yourself, you know, that's a really tough pill to swallow because I do know people that, have, you know, they're in their 60s and 70s that have been smoking since they were teenagers. And they're like, man, you know, I think I smoked my whole life away, you know, and that's a really kind of painful thing to discover when you're when you're that uh, much older. But if used properly, I definitely feel like it's very additive to your life. And it's just a basically an education thing, because when you grow up and you think about you think about taking these things that shift your consciousness and taking away from your productivity, you know, it's very easy to see why people think it's a bad thing. But as Andrew Yang said, you know, we got to start getting away from like looking at like the value of a person as what their economic impact is to society. And if they could impact it positively, they're a good person. And if mm -hmm. they don't, then they're a bad person. I think that's a very bad way to, to look at it in a visual. And that's why I think when, when people take time out to do these psychedelics and they need two or three days, people are like, well, are you just wasting 72 hours? And, you know, my response is, well, isn't 72 hours like a small price to pay for like a lifetime of changes, right? And this is, this is always doing it under the right context. You know, like I'm not telling you to just take mushrooms and go out into the forest and, you know, have some epiphanies and speak to God. You know, I'm talking about doing them in clinical settings where you have five, six, maybe 10 uh, talk therapy sessions with your clinician before you do your session so that you understand, you know, all the trauma that you're trying to address. And when you understand what you're trying to get out of one of these psychedelic journeys, um, it's much easier to find, you know, the truth and the answers that you're looking for than if you just took these things and, you know, just had like all these weird visions and, um, you know, weird ideas pop into your head. And ultimately, like I said, you know, um, in Michael Pollan's book, uh, uh, John Hopkins University, which just expanded their psilocybin uh, a treatment center, you know, they, they completed a 15 year study. And after 15 years, you know, north of 85% of the people had still been um, remembering the impacts of, 
of their single psilocybin journey as one of the most impactful events of their life and ultimately what opened up their hearts so that they could they could receive more and not have like all these like really rigid blocks in front of them that are keeping people out. Yeah. And I really like how you said that the best way to use certain substances like that is to obviously do it um, with purpose and not, you know, I mean, like you said, it could be abused. So I, I was thinking back because I used to think that, you know, people who do acid or ecstasy and then they have these or shrooms and they have these epiphanies. I'm like, dude, like you're probably just brainwashed. Like you saw some weird vision and like, you're fucking crazy now. But then after a while, I like started watching these um, or listening to these philosophers and learning that they were on certain substances. Then I'm like, Hmm, maybe if you properly use these things, right. Then you have these visions and you kind of pick it apart. And then you kind of like uh, pick at it from different layers. And then you can actually figure some shit out. Um, and then to be a productive human being in that sense is just sharing that wisdom and that value back to the community and like literally giving the community food for thought. And I really like that. That's like being the, the productive user, right? Yeah. And, you know, I, I shared a lot of your same hesitations, you know, like, you know, when I grew up, um, cannabis and crack cocaine were kind of like classified in the same category. So I was like very, very scared of taking all these different drugs. But if you look at all these different indigenous cultures, all these indigenous cultures had some sort of plant medicine that they used as a rites of passage for like women or boys to become, or, or girls or, and boys to become women and men. And it's interesting because a lot of these things, I mean, I don't know what your experience level is with these um, plant medicines, but, you know, like I said, I had very much the same fears of like, oh man, if I take this thing, like, you know, am I just having like, you know, all these neurochemicals, um, just doing all sorts of weird shit in my brain. And I think I'm speaking to God, but it's really just, you know, a figment of my imagination. And, um, it, it, uh, on the board of my company, or actually on the health advisory board, we have a doctor. His name is Dr. Michael Halperin. He is a retired neurosurgeon out of uh, 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 USF, and that's actually um, where um, they call it like the, the – he's like one of the fathers of neuroscience. And he was actually telling me like the way these – the psychedelics work is I always thought it was adding chemicals into your brain and you were seeing all these things. And he actually said, it's the opposite. It's not adding anything to your brain. They're utilizing different mechanisms to shut down your cognitive brain. And your cognitive brain is responsible for filtering out north of 90% of the data. And the reason why your cognitive brain has to has to filter out all this data is that if you notice how beautiful like the flowers were on the sidewalk, or how beautiful this building was architected. Like it would be really hard for you to focus on, you know, doing your homework, you know? So your cognitive brain is always filtering out all this information. And when you take these psychedelics, it quiets down the cognitive brain. And all of a sudden, instead of 10 bits of data, you're getting 20 bits, 30 bits, 50 bits, 100 bits. And when you're getting all that data, you know, just like if you look at a computer, if, it, if it's used to getting 16 or 32 bits of data and you start feeding it 64 or 512 bits of data, it starts slowing down and it's all unstructured and it has trouble making sense of it, right? And this is why having like a, a shaman or a, a clinician there to help you sort all that information is so important because you're overwhelmed by it. You know, and this is why a lot of people have wrong ideas about taking psychedelics, because if they take it in this other context, it does almost feel like your brain is going crazy because, you know, you can't process all that information. But once you start understanding like these biochemical mechanisms of how these things work, you start realizing, oh, shit, you know, there's much more to reality than the five senses that we have, you know, and a good analogy that I like to use is like, if we didn't have the sense of smell. Like I would have no idea the guy sitting next to me has been like farting for the last five hours, you know, and just because I don't smell that gas doesn't mean I'm not sitting in that gas. Right. So we have five senses. Um, and even within those five senses, we have a limited range, you know, like we only see a limited range of the light spectrum. We only smell like a certain range. We only hear a certain range. And when you start taking these psychedelics and it takes like those governors off, and you start experiencing stuff outside of the range. That's why people see all that sacred geometry or those other patterns and stuff. And 
Yeah, it's really interesting when you think, oh, shit, it's not adding to my brain, but you're actually just seeing more of what objective reality really is. Now, I'm not saying that there's like floating spirits like all around us all this time. But what I'm saying is that like what we think of as objective reality, you know, is quite different than what objective reality is. And we could go into that a little bit later. Dude, because there's oh, I was about to ask you, like, so I had this crazy thought, right? Call me, call me crazy, but but you know how when you perceive things, right? Like your senses before your brain processes, it, there's like a slight delay, right? So yes. so what happens if like you cut that middleman out, that delay, and then you actually perceive reality in that moment, hundred percent? And then how does that? Um, and what is every individual's person's reality at that point different from yours? You know, it's like unique because like you're seeing everything right then and there, no delay, and that blew my my mind so like what we see right now what we're processing it's it's like changing every split second yeah yeah we're basically like um we're rendering reality in our brains in real time basically and you know actually not to digress but i think you guys would dig this there's a professor in uc irvine dr donald hoffman um he talks about objective reality and this guy's never taken a psychedelic in his life which kind of blew my mind because the stuff that he's talking about is very much in the realm of psychedelics but he says like the reality that we see is not objective reality we're given a specific user interface that just helps us survive and basically he ran all these simulations of creatures of similar complexity one group would see objective reality for what it is and then the other group was just uh, tuned for survival Survival. And the group that was tuned for survival um, outpaced the growth of the ones that saw objective reality 100% of the time. So a good example he gives is like, we're all looking into a computer screen right now, right? And we're all able to utilize an interface in this reality. But if we kind of take a microscope to this computer screen, well, we'll see that, you know, Chris, you're just a bunch of little pixels. Vincent, <laughs> you're just a bunch of little pixels. And all of these little pixels like form this image so that I could see like this form of yourself. But if we go even one step further behind that, well, it's all these transistors and diodes behind the screen. That's actually the objective reality. Like this is just a user interface for us to interact with each other. So he uses this as a thesis of saying that we don't need to understand objective reality to live or to control objective reality. And we all evolved with a certain user interface that allows us to survive, you know? So if we see a tiger, it's time to fucking run. If we see a steak, let's go eat that. You know, it's all tuned for survival and ultimately um, he believes that consciousness is the basis of the universe. And he believes that everything has consciousness, including like rocks, plants, different things like that, like a desk. And he believes that because like a rock or a desk has no impact on our survival, we just don't have a communication mechanism to those types of things or that type of consciousness. And it gets like really, really out there and wacky, but he's been interviewed by guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Sam Harris, you know, like these really high level intellectuals. And after like these three or four hour interviews, everyone is bought in on his concept, you know, that we are just seeing a very, very finite um, slice of reality and that the objective reality around us is far more fantastic and bizarre that we could ever think it was. And, you know, I kind of had like that really crazy like background um, that I was <laughs> utilizing before I went with the stainless steel one. And yeah, he talks about like, yeah, you know, objective reality probably looks something like that where it's this, you know, um, I don't know if you guys ever watched Doctor Strange and he like travels oh, yeah. through like time and space, you know, he's like, it's probably like that, you know, but we're all born with this user interface. So me, you and Chris, like when we see a Tesla car, you know, it all looks like a Tesla car, but yeah, behind this reality, you know, could be like other transistors and diodes just making this 3D environment for us to exist in. And that's where it starts getting really trippy. And when I think about that and what I've seen in psychedelics, there's a lot of overlap there, but you know, my mind is not smart enough or powerful enough to kind of reconcile all these things that I've learned, but it does give me more belief that, um, that there is more to this life than just these finite like meat sacks that we're occupying right now. And that after we die, you know, our consciousness is not just tied to these uh, physical bodies, 
And like our brain isn't the source of the consciousness. Our brain is more like a radio tuner that is tapping into the frequency of your consciousness. And that's why like when you get brain damaged, you know, like, and people are schizophrenic, it's kind of like you're in between radio stations where sometimes you're picking up 98.9 and sometimes you're picking up 99.1. And it's like kind of trippy to think about, about it that way. But as we learn more about the brain, um, it's starting to become more of a reality because as you were saying, you know, like, like we don't see everything in real time. And there's been tests that have been proven time and time and again, that like, if you ask someone a yes or no question, like they have machines that could tell you your answer anywhere from a half second all the way to seven seconds before you realize it. So what is going on? What decision-making is happening in your body before your conscious mind makes up your Damn. mind? Damn. And you're telling me this guy that you mentioned, what was his name again? From uh, uh, doc US Dr. Michael Halpern. He, so he never took any drugs ever. Like uh, never yeah, he, he's never taken anything. That's, what a natural. that's really interesting. Like just kind of like going back to like the whole like thought process and like kind of just like um, how each individual has their own, technically like their own perception, right, of reality. Mm -hmm. That really, yeah, like the way you explain it, how it like ties into like the uh, cognitive mind and everything like that, how it's how, what you perceive. It's not really what the world is around you. It's really deep just because of the fact that like, you know, it's like you said, right? If, our, if we had full access to our brain, right, without like a shaman or a professional to like really guide us, it's really gonna like take us in for like um, a real shift in the world, right? Because like, it's like, when you don't have these people to guide you, it's like now your brain's like working at like 100% capacity where nothing's filtered and your perception of the world around you is gonna be now conflicted with like your cognitive mind, right? Because you're gonna see everything for what it is but then your cognitive mind is like the like you know the um, reasoning behind everything, right? Correct. Like, yeah. Why, why why is this like this? Why is this like a bottle here a bottle, right? Why is this bottle a bottle? You know, and then it's like now all that's out the window. You're now battling with yourself. It's just a crazy thought to really like think that we're not really using a big portion of our brain just because of the fact that to process everything around us would just send us into like sensory overload, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's also a lot of evidence that our brains are shrinking too. Um, if you look at like the skulls of Homo sapiens from a quarter uh, a million years ago, um, the capacity was about 10% higher. And they believe that as we made the shift from hunter gatherers to agricultural and now to the industrial and information age, you know, we've had to require less and less of our senses. And we've actually outsourced like at this point, like, you know, when I was younger, we used maps, you know, to like drive across and get to destinations. Same. Now, yeah, now, you know, with GPS, like I could drive to a place like five times and I still don't know how to get there. You know, it's because I've <laughs> completely like outsourced all of that to like my phone. Whereas before, if I just drove there once, like I could always drive back because I had to map everything out. And it's just interesting like that um, as we outsource more to technology, we're actually becoming like lesser versions of ourselves where we don't have to use our sense of smell to smell like pheromones of like people if they're like pissed or anything like that, or like our sense of hearing like, oh shit, there's like a, a tiger coming across the 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 hill we better like prepare to run you know like all those things uh, because we don't have to have those heightened senses of awareness now you know we are becoming a a different version of homo sapien and you know this is the one thing like this isn't my words but when the guy told me like it it really made a lot of sense is that we're going to be the last generation of homo sapien you know like um wearables are already um, in style, implantables are going to be something that uh, the generation below you is probably going to be 100% compatible and okay with. And when people always say, oh, shit, like, nah, we will never want to become like part man or machine. I always like just chuckle. I go, dude, you're already part man and machine. And they go, what do you mean? I'm like, look, we've been talking for five minutes and you've been staring at your phone for three of those minutes. You're that machine you know, you could detach it from your body, but it's a part of you at this point. If you leave the mm -hmm. house without your cell phone, you will go back and get it. It's a part of you. You know, it's a part of you now. It's just not 
in you. And, you know, with like Google glasses or like those contact lenses where you could have a user interface, like it's very easy for me to see, like, if you don't need to carry this thing around and you could just have it implanted in you, like people will be comfortable. Like people my age, they wouldn't do it. You know, maybe people your age might be open to it, but the generation below you will not think it's, it's even a thing. It's like, of course, put it in me. Like, yeah. I don't want to have to carry my phone. Just put it in me. They can make TikTok videos easier. That's why. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they care about. Definitely. But, all for the gram. All for oh, the gram. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> but that's a, that's, that's a really crazy thought to like, um, think about, right? Like, I never really thought of us like that, right? Especially like homo, homo sapiens and everything like that. And how we technically are the last generation to be homo, uh, homo sapiens, right? It's like the thought that technology is kind of like, you know, all around us and like how we take in that information and how we like constantly are like attached to it, right? Like you said, how you can't leave your house without your phone, right? Or like how you, how we're kind of like currently, currently interacting right now on the uh, computer and everything like that and just kind of like talking to each other, you know, through these diodes, right? Through these transistors and everything like that. It's just mind boggling that, you know, we're at a time where human contact doesn't happen. Right? Yeah. It's really crazy that like without human contact, we're still able to communicate with each other. It's crazy to think that, you know, like I don't need to see you to really hear your voice. You know, it's like, it really takes you down a rabbit hole of like, what is reality now and what is unreality right yeah because like for some like especially like the um the younger generations right who grew up with technology who grew up with the ipads who grew up with like the computers and like help like my younger brother all right who's like half my age is more tech savvy than i am in some senses and it's just mind-boggling me you know it's like i don't understand how that works like it, it's obviously because like, you know, they grew up with these products that they're more easily like malleable, right? Kind of like how, when we were younger, we grew up with bikes, sticks, balls, and everything like that, right? We're more proficient at those activities, right? Yep. And it's like, it's just a crazy shift, right? It's like, we are really shifting towards that, like mechanic or like the machined state now, right? We're really shifting towards like, Oh, your doctor can technically be like a computer now, right? Your telecommunication. Your, your, yeah, exactly. It's like telecommunication, right? Your doctor's gonna be a computer. Computers store information, and like sooner or later, we're gonna have those what do you call them? Um, quantum computers, right? That will answer every single question that you ever had in your entire life, and it'll be like it'll spit out the data like that. Yeah, it's like crazy to think about. Oh, it's it's super crazy to think about, and you know it it it. it you know, one of the reasons why, like, um, you know, my wife and I, we were talking, you know, once, once, once I'm done with this last company, you know, hopefully we could like cash out and live a different life. But we're, we're going to basically, we've been looking at different farms and I'm really trying to get out of the city. Um, I, I've lived in San Francisco basically all of my life and I love the city and, you know, I was so proud of San Francisco and I still am. You know, but what, you know, if we go back to what I said about like our human biology, you know, it, it hasn't really shifted for the last 250,000 years. So, you know, what I realize is we, we, we have biology that is like hunter gatherer biology, but we're sitting in cubicles all day. We're sitting in front of computers all day. We're being super productive revenues going higher, but you know, mental health seems to be going down, you know? So we talked about like for the last phase of our life, you know, cause we're probably not going to be like the humans that have like gene editing through CRISPR or um, things like that. Maybe our kids will, but you know, we really just wanted to live, you know, the rest of our lives, you know, in the optimal state for homo sapiens, you know, and this is why I think a lot of people are like more into camping, more into hiking, you know, doing all these things um, that, that really help our physical body versus, you know, like when I was younger, or I mean, even now, you know, like a lot of my friends that are still in tech, you know, they love telling me like they've only slept like three or four hours and they're, they're crushing it and getting work done, you know, like uh, getting shit done at work and, you know, just being like super productive. And, 
you know, to me, I was like, man, it's, it's kind of sad to think like, like, is, is my whole life about working 60 hours a week and being proud of it? You know, like, like one of the things that I remember is when I first started going to old folks homes and teaching them about cannabis, you know, there was never a single old person that ever said, I wish I worked more in my life. You know, they always said the opposite, which was, I wish I spent more time with friends. I wish I spent more time doing my hobbies. I wish I spent more time doing anything other than work. And, you know, I mean, I used to pride myself on being super productive, you know, like I was a sales guy at these software companies and, you know, like they, they measure you based on how much sales you have, you know, and I was typically the highest sales guy. So, you know, like I, I always measured like my own mental health and productivity based on how much I sold. And pretty soon I realized I was like, fuck, you know, this is like, just like playing some random sport and just trying to like always build up points. But it's like, do you even like playing that game? You know, mm. maybe I'm playing basketball and I'm the best scorer, but I really just want to play ping pong instead, right? So now, you know, what I realized for my wife and I, you know, getting a farm and living a simpler life where, you know, the the reputation of a person or how well they're liked has nothing to do with how many Instagram followers they have or how many companies they run. It's just based on, you know, are you a cool person and are you adding value to my life, you know? Mm. Um, to that, uh, before we shot this podcast, you know, I do those like promotions, like letting people know who our guests are going to be. And, um, to some of my friends and viewers, uh, when telling them what the topics we're going to talk about, one of the questions that they brought up was, isn't it easier to say like, oh, um, making all this money and being at the top, um, it's not that happy. Like, I just want to live a simpler life. Isn't it easier to say that when you have it versus like, you know, someone who's trying to get to your level? Oh yeah, that's a great question. That's a very good question. And they're absolutely right. You know, so all these things that I've done, I don't regret doing any of them because it's what has taught me, you know, the true lessons. And, you know, these were things that I remember people telling me when I was younger, you know, do what you love, don't chase the money. And, you know, I was like, well, that's easy for you to say when you could easily pay rent, right? And then what I realized was, and this is why people are afraid of success too, is if you get all of your dreams and you're still unhappy, then what right so and that's the fundamental question which is um if you i think you have to accomplish and achieve a bunch of your goals that you set out to do and see if they make you happy and what i've come to realize at least for me is you know like being an entrepreneur it's like you know i always told people i want to change the world you know i want to i want to you know have full control over my destiny you know, I, I, I'm a pro cannabis activist. Um, I love being healthy. So, you know, I'm in the cannabis industry now. I make the healthiest device, you know, it, it, it works really well. And these are all reasons uh, why I would tell people I was an entrepreneur. But deep down, if I had to be honest, the main reason why I'm an entrepreneur is my dad was a CEO. And I knew like my dad wanted one of his kids to be a CEO. And even though um, I knew he was proud of me, like I felt like unless I was a CEO, he wouldn't like kind of like see me on the same level as him. So, you know, and you know, like my dad passed away like a month ago, right? And I, I already knew he was proud of me regardless if I was a CEO or not. But now that he's passed, what I've realized was, you know, like the desire to have him accept me was like way stronger than I was willing to give it credit for. You know, I was just kind of like, ah, yeah, that's what little like young Sabo thought. But, you know, 43 year old Sabo, like I'm past that. But what I realized is I wasn't past that. So what I needed to get real with was like, am I, am I really, am I really working on my dream or am I working on the dream of what I think society wants me to be? And ultimately like what this has kind of like moved into was like, I was like, oh shit, like I don't have to be the CEO. I could just hire another CEO and I could be the chief product officer of my company. Like I want to design products. I want to make cool shit. I don't want to have to raise money. I don't want to have to talk to investors. I don't want to have to make every single decision in the company and that's okay. We'll have another guy do that and I'll just design cool shit, 
you know, and that's been like really, really freeing. And ultimately, you know, I know I gave like a really long answer to that question, but you know, it's very nuanced because, you know, you do have to, you do have to attain your goals to, I think, realize that like some of the goals that you are chasing were not your own goals. And the flip side is, you know, like I said, like if, like a lot of people, their desire is to become financially independent and not have to worry about money. And I know tons of people that have reached that. And once they reach that, they realize, oh shit, I thought this was going to give me fulfillment in life, but all it gave me was financial security. So I need to find out who I am and what I really want to do. And this is why I love Flowmasters so much, Vincent, is like in Flowmasters, you can't be thinking and planning. You just got to do what you feel. Right. And yeah. that's what I think is very important is everyone's thinking and planning this whole time and not paying attention to how they feel and what they really want to do. And that's kind of like the big message, which is, yeah, like it's super easy for me to have hindsight 2020. But the flip side is if you learn your lesson and you keep on going down the same path, then you're the one that's blind, you know. And yeah, so I'm acknowledging that you do have to hit a certain threshold of financial security to know that money's not important. But, you know. I, I think that if you put in a reasonable effort and you have a good plan, financial security, in my opinion, is not that difficult. Finding fulfillment while having financial security, you know, that is the more difficult challenge. For sure. And shout out to Gavin Masamiya for Flowmasters. Um, for our listeners and viewers on this episode, if you haven't yet, check out the episode with Gavin. He talks more about Flowmasters and what that is about. Super cool, dude. Super cool session. So make sure to check that out. Um, but stable for you, what, uh, how did you manage to balance family and companies? What was that like for you? Oh man, you know, it was uh, really difficult, you know, but I made it a point that I would, any, any time I wasn't traveling, I would be home at six, you know, and then I would, sp uh, from six to eight, I would turn off my phone to be with my family. And that's when my daughters go to bed. So I would have like a lot of, uh, solid two hours and really balance it out that way. And ultimately, you know, like I would always tell people like I'm doing this business for my family. Right. And uh, my wife had to remind me, it's like, well, you're not around for your family that often because you're traveling yeah. all the time. So I, I had to like really kind of like reassess my priorities and, you know, not to take it back to psychedelics, but um, I had a really, really rough um, psychedelic, you know, some, some people might call it a bad trip, but it's actually one of the trips that I learned the, the biggest lesson from was, you know, um, well, I don't think it's, it, it's a surprise to anyone. I, I love to talk, you know, and in one of these journeys, I bumped into basically like the bizarro version of me, except he was like a better speaker than me. He was like just a little bit quicker in the brain than me. So like all the different, um, all the different ways I would use to communicate in order to bring the momentum back to my side, he was able to, you know, take all those those mind games I was trying to play with them and like throw them back. And ultimately what he challenged me on, he was like saying, Hey, look, you know, like look at your Facebook feed. It's just pictures of you and your wife and it's pictures of you and your kids. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then he goes, that's not you. You're a phony. And I go, how can it not be me? I'm in the photos, you know? And then he goes, well, let me show you something. And you know, he starts taking me into like the photos and like the photos start animating again. And he shows a photo of like me eating with my family. And I take a picture of me and my family. And then right after the picture's taken, it shows me on my phone, like posting the photo. And then I'm just like, kind of like engrossed with my phone and I'm not really there with the family, you know? And uh, basically like this went on for like, I think like a good, like 90 minutes. Um, it's hard to tell because I was just in my head. Um, and then after the 90 minutes, I just finally gave up. I was like, you're right, dude. Like, what I'm showing the world is not congruent with how I'm really living my life, you know? And um, what was interesting was once I surrendered to whatever that entity was, you know, like all like these negative bad trip feelings like went away. And ultimately, you know, it, it is what made me want to make sure that, you know, what I'm doing is congruent with what I'm showing people online. You know, like I know everyone with their social media has like a very curated social social presence, right? And um, it wasn't that I wasn't with my family or it wasn't that I wasn't with my wife. It was just that I was showing like a exaggerated version of it. And I wanted um, my digital presence to be more congruent with 
who I was as a real person. So one of the little tricks that I played on myself now is that anytime I do anything, like it has to be like a fuck yes. You know, like, do I want to do this? Fuck yeah. Okay, I'll do it. If it's a maybe, I just don't do it anymore. And then the other check that I have is like, I go, all right, would I learn about this subject or would I do this hobby or would I do this activity if I couldn't tell anybody about it? I couldn't tell my wife about it. I couldn't post about it on, on social media. Would I still do this? And if the answer is yes, then I'll do it. If the answer is no, then I know it's me trying to control the narrative of how people view me. Mm -hmm. I remember you and I talked about that, like doing good for the community. Like if when I decided on my on my part to just give a homeless person like food or drinks, or when you wanted to, uh, you and uh, some colleagues of Burner Labs, right, went to go deliver food for the front line, I believe, right. uh, mm -hmm. when COVID was at its peak. Um, stuff like that. I remember I, I asked you that question. I was like, so what does that mean? And you gave that exact same answer uh, is if would you have done it, if it wasn't going to be on social media, then yes, then that means your intentions are still pure. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, like when it comes to like, um, like giving a homeless person money or donating food, I would say, well, even if your intentions aren't pure, go do it anyways, because you're helping someone, you know, but yeah, right. just understand that part of it is to make yourself feel good. And I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with that. You know, if you want to learn something and show it off to someone, because it's cool, you know, by all means, like, feel free to do that. But, you know, for myself, it was just more of like understanding, okay, am I doing this for others? Am I serving others right now? Or am I really serving myself? And being able to delineate the two, I've been able to give more of myself because I know when I need to recover and recharge. And when I do that, I could give more of myself. And many times I was basically lying to myself saying, I'm doing this for others when it was really just a self-serving thing. Mm -hmm. That's actually a really uh, interesting, like uh, that you brought that up. Cause like it just kind of like what popped up into my head where was a like, kind of like a um, epiphany, right? Of like, that really was like kind of reminiscent of like more of like, um, what do you call it? Uh, like the ghost of Christmas past, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it's kind of like, you know, the, the exaggerated version of yourself, right? In a sense. And he's like kind of guiding you through like your life, right? It's like, what's the meaning of this? Like, why did you, you know, choose to do this? When in reality, right, you, you thought, right? Your, or your assumptions were like, you thought you were doing it because, you know, you are that family man, right? You are that go-getter, right? You are spending time with your family. And then they revealed your ulterior motive, which is just kind of like to direct that narrative that you're trying to achieve, right? Yeah. And then just kind of like opening up to that is like a really big thing. Because like a lot of times, what a, a lot of people suffer in our day and age actually is a, they suffer from like finding their own identity, right? Because they see all these individuals on social media, right? Kind of posting their narrative, right? Seeing that, oh, man, this is so beautiful. It's so perfect, right? It's, it's, it's almost like, you know, unattainable. But then it's like what they then don't perceive is like the story behind that, right? Yes, there's going to be some that are kind of trying to direct their narrative, but there's also the few that aren't doing that, right? That are do that. That's like, let's say, you know, we're going to Cabo, right? And this really beautiful, like, waterfall or whatever right and i took a picture of that what people can't see is the path that the individual took to get there right because that's your narrative right and that's all you right for all they know you are an influencer that got a plane a free plane ticket to fly over there and take this beautiful picture but what could also happen, right, is that, you know, you're that hardworking individual, right, that 60-hour, like, you know, work week individual that doesn't really post on social media all that often, right, and then, like, it's like, you know what, I need to take a break, right, and then you go there on this spiritual journey, right, and just kind of relax with your family, and then you just happen to come upon this beautiful waterfall, and then you're like, that is really beautiful, and then you document it there, and then as a way to remind yourself of why you took that trip right kind of yeah. like playing both sides of it right now it's like it's just because our world is so caught up in like the instant gratification right that we can't receive what it took to, for the individual to get there right because even the influencer right that got there with a free, a free plane ticket still had to build up his following you know still had to work hard and diligent to you know get to where he's at you know it's just a crazy thought 
mm-hmm. that yeah. like you know, our world's kind of like all caught up in this instant gratification and everything like that. And they don't, it's just really disheartening, right? Because like, it's really the work that, you know, you do that allows you to figure out what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. In my eyes. Yeah, that was well said. And, you know, Sable, when you mentioned your wife bringing up that, uh, you know, that thought to you, um, it just makes me want to say, like, give giving credit to a strong partner or significant other or even like a team member, bringing those that thought to you to process and like, are you really doing this right? Like, or or even like, yes, you're doing it for the family, you're doing it for the team, but but you're not even here for the team. Like, you know, because we're, I feel like us three right now, we 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 all, we have that like hustle, go get it mentality, but then we forget to you know like zoom out and like, oh shit, we're not even in it. You know. Yeah. We get yeah. lost. We get lost. Thank you both. Both are sharing that. And Chris, shout out for uh, the ghost of Christmas past and the Ebenezer Scrooge <laughs> reference. Because, you know, I was actually going to use that, but I was like, man, I think these guys are too young. Like that was already like oh. an old ass story when I was younger, you know? So I was like, do they even tell this story anymore? I mean, uh, like that's a really old story though, you know, Ebene- Ebenezer Scrooge, right? He's like all the way back, you know, back, back in the day. It's like an old, ch- uh, old board, right? If I'm not yeah. mistaken. No, but it, I mean, on my trip, it was definitely like that, you know, like my spirit basically took me to like, you know, different moments of my life and had me watch it like play out in front of me and go, look, you know, like, this is how you remembered this memory, but this is what actually happened. And, you know, it's interesting because um, I think, you know, as much as I was trying to control the narrative for other people to see, you know, it, it was, I think, me trying to reaffirm to myself that I was being a good husband and a good father by taking and posting those photos. And like, you know, so it, 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 could, be as, it could be as bad as me trying to trick people into thinking I'm a good bad, or it could be as innocent as me just trying to reaffirm to myself that I'm being a good dad and husband. But ultimately, you know, having that awareness to understand and delineate the difference, I think, you know, really makes a difference in in people's lives because, you know, life is so confusing right now. There's so much information out there. You know, you have like a lot of topics are nuanced and not black and white. So as you're learning, it's like very easy to like oscillate to one side or the other, you know, like we just had like crazy protests, right? And like, you know, I've had to explain to a lot of people the difference between BLM and ALM and like really seeing like, oh shit, like people are living in like vastly different realities but you know like just just yelling at them like like saying ALM is like so dumb and whatever you know that doesn't change their mind and you know really understanding like why they think all lives matter and why they don't understand why black lives matter you know isn't saying like black lives are more important but it's just more that they want equal rights you know it just shows like how how different the realities are and ultimately I feel like you know, it all starts with having your own self-awareness of your own blind spots and where, where you might not have some understanding. And, you know, I think Vincent and I were talking, you know, a few weeks ago, you know, about just getting more, more educated on, on racial things. And, you know, I remember reading a post by Vincent, which was, he was like, well, you know, now I'm just going to just try to listen, you know, I'll just try to listen more. And I felt like that was very powerful because, you know, in a time when everyone's trying to give advice and like, this is the right way or this is the wrong way. It's like, well, are we trying to be right? Or are we trying to solve this problem? And if we're going to try to solve this problem, I think we just got to do, do more listening. And that's even with like, you know, as difficult as it is for me to say, that's even for like Trump supporters, you know, we got to listen to them. We got to really understand like why they have so much of this animosity in their hearts for, for, you know, immigrants that are just coming in and doing the jobs that they don't want to do, you know, and by understanding that, I feel like you can start, you know, building the bridges to come to a place where, you know, it's not alt-right and far left, but it's just more like, hey, we're the progressives that want to move some ideas that need to be progress along. And we're the conservatives that are here to conserve some ideas that have been proven to be worth conserving, like, you know, love thy neighbor or don't kill anyone. You know, we got to conserve those ideas. For sure. Um, and I appreciate that, Sable. Uh, so this is actually about almost about the time that we have. Um, so we're going to wrap this up real quick. Sabo, what last bit of advice would you like to leave our listeners or viewers? Yeah, you know, the last bit of advice, you know, I don't know what your demographic is, but I'm assuming a lot of Asian males watch this. 
So I'm going to do a little plug for our boy, Gavin Masumiya, which is, hey, come show up to Flowmaster Fridays. Flowmaster Fridays is a place where you're going to discover a whole lot more about yourself. You're going to find a new level of just being able to free yourself and express yourself with no filter. And this is coming from one that really felt like I had no filter. Like I said all the shit that I wanted to do. I work in a space where it's controversial, not just controversial for a Caucasian person, but super duper uh, controversial if you're like an Asian American. And ultimately, I found that uh, going through Flowmasters, it helped me even find a more authentic voice and to the point where I realized like, this is not something I want to do for the rest of my life. You know, there's other more important things for me. So um, if you guys are, are open on a Friday, you know, come to Flowmasters and another piece of advice is just love yourself more, you know, give yourself a little bit more, more leeway, you know, like when you mess up or if you don't accomplish things, you know, you're not a piece of shit, your self-worth isn't tied to how productive you are and just really work on being a better human being. But if you are one of those people that is a little bit behind and you want to catch up in life, then absolutely, you know, focus and make sure you get all your shit done because you can't become a black belt in something until you go become a yellow belt, green belt, blue belt, purple belt, red belt, brown belt. And I'm not saying I'm a black belt in anything, but I have achieved, I would say at least like red belt, brown belt status in a few things. And just, you know, uh, being able to look back and see the areas where I could have improved on or the areas that, you know, the only problem was not the world, but just the way I've looked at the world, you know, it's given me this hindsight of, you know, just having 2020, which is number one, be kind to yourself. And number two, if you do need to hustle, well, don't be afraid to hustle either. Awesome. Thank you That's so very much. very beautiful. I like that. I like that a lot. Uh, well, Sable, where can they find you um, on social media? Any plugs for you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I think I just signed up for TikTok too. Oh. Um, I, I haven't done any videos, but uh, it should just be Sabo Shen, my first and last name, at Sabo Shen. And uh, the company is Burner Lab, B-R-N-R-L-A-B.com. If you guys are into cannabis and looking for higher pieces of hardware that don't break the bank, go check us out. We just launched uh, yesterday, actually. We had over 500 people attend the, the launch, and man, um, it went really well. So um, if you guys could support another Asian-run company, I would really appreciate it. And if you don't know, uh, if you don't use cannabis yourself, you know, let someone know that we exist. Definitely. Sure. Definitely. All right. So, Vince, would you like to close us out? Sure. Um, for our viewers and listeners, you can find us on all streaming platforms at The Eating Cast, Instagram podcast, uh, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify. Uh, so, yeah. So, check us out. And we're always appreciating any kind of feedback you guys leave us, uh, any guest recommendations, any questions that you want to ask the guests, always DM us. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, feature you guys on it. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, again, Sabo, we just want to thank you again for taking a part of your day and joining us with this little discussion that we had. It was definitely really fun. And with that said, uh, to our viewers and our listeners, we just want to thank you guys for tuning in and we'll catch you on the next one. Take care and bye-bye. All Bye. right. Support all these beautiful Asian men over here. Yes, yes. Hey. I love it. I love it. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. This is super dope and look forward to the next one.